thank you so much for joining me today. We are continuing our study of John's gospel this week, and we'll be jumping back to John 16. Will you pray with me as we get started? God, thank you so much for today. And we just thank you for this gospel and what it has been teaching us about Jesus and just John's portrait of Jesus, God. And I pray that as we continue to read, as we continue to study, that you'll speak to our hearts and that you will illuminate your scripture for us, God. We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So John 16 today, we last week was Easter. And we jumped ahead to the resurrection, but now we're going to go back in time and we're going to finish up talking about John's gospel for over the next few weeks. So if you remember two weeks ago when we were in John 15, we were still in the middle of the discourse that is happening in the upper room, connected with the Last Supper, all of those things. And we are still there as the stage opens here in John 16. So it's the same setting. This is continuing that farewell discourse uh, that, that uh, Jesus is giving to his disciples. He's continuing to prepare them for what will come. And he is continuing to unpack and explain the coming of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to be looking starting uh, at the very, very end of chapter 15, starting in verse 26. And we're going to go all the way through chapter 16 today. And we're going to just talk about it in sections and probably not going to read huge chunks. We're going to refer to some different things as we read through this. So starting here at the end of chapter 15 in verse 26, Jesus says about the Holy Spirit, says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the father, he will testify about me. And you must also testify for you have been with me from the beginning. So we see another promise of the Holy Spirit that Jesus is going to send the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit what he calls the advocate and also the spirit of truth. And we'll see spirit of truth and advocate pop up later in this passage as well. That the Holy Spirit, one of the things that he is going to do when he comes is he will testify about Jesus. So just as the Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus, so should the disciples. So this idea of testifying or bearing witness. So the Holy Spirit is going to bear witness to who Jesus is and what he has done. And the disciples who have been with Jesus from the beginning should also do that. And then Jesus goes on here at the beginning of chapter 16 and continues to prepare his disciples for what will come. And as I read, I want to read a few verses of this. I want you to think about how would you have felt if you were one of the disciples hearing Jesus says, saying these things. So he says that he's telling them these things so that he won't fall away. And then here in verse two, it says, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the father or me. So things are looking a little bleak for the disciples. And he had talked, Jesus had talked to them a little bit about that at the end of chapter 15, a few verses ahead of that, talking about how the world was going to hate them. But he's giving them a little bit more uh, detail now, being put out of the synagogue and that they might be killed because anyone who kills them is going to think they are doing God a service. And here uh, it makes me think of Paul and what Paul did before he became a Christ follower. He was sent out to persecute the Christians, to round them up, to throw them in prison, to uh, possibly have them killed. And it was he was... Here he was, he was a member of the ruling council being sent out to go and do that. And so that's, you know, he, we see this here with Jesus giving that warning that there will be people in, who will go out to kill and they will be to kill the followers of Jesus and that it will be considered a service, an offering of service to God. And I don't know about you, but if I was one of the disciples hearing this, I think it would have really bothered me. I mean, Jesus has already talked about how the world is going to hate them and persecute them. And they've already been warned that what about what's going to happen to Jesus. And it, this would have just been very unsettling at the least, if not downright disturbing. But here Jesus is saying that to follow him and to do life in, 
in, in pattering our lives after him is, is to go the way of the cross, to be, not to be alarmed when they're rejected, to not be alarmed whenever they face trials and tribulations and that the opposition is going to be terrible because Jesus faces terrible opposition. And he's telling them this ahead of time so that they will not be, they will not fall away. Then Jesus is going to remind them that he is leaving, that he is going to go to the father. He does that um, in verse five. And then he, he says, not yet. None of you asks me, where are you going? And even though we know if we were to flip backwards in to John 13, at the end of John 13, the beginning of John 14, both Peter and Thomas do ask Jesus. Uh, Peter asks him, where, Lord, where are you going? After Jesus is telling um, them that he's going to be glorified. And then Thomas says, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And so they both do ask him something similar. Uh, and scholars have posited lots of reasons for why Jesus would say this in this way. But the one that I found the most intriguing and the most thoughtful um, thought provoking it is just the one that they were so overcome by their grief. I mean, Jesus says that here and uh, that they have kind of stopped asking questions. They're just, uh, I mean, think about it. Jesus has just said, you're going to endure all of this terrible stuff and I'm going to go away. I'm not going to be here to bear it with you. So you're going to be taking the full brunt of the hatred and the persecution that is being lobbed at you from the religious leaders and from the world in general. And here they're just completely filled with grief. And he's saying, hey, you need to focus on the what's about to happen in the sense of what, what good is going to happen. And that's what he's going to follow up here in verse 7. But uh, very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Now, why would it be good that he is going away for the disciples? And it's because the Holy Spirit is going to come. The advocate cannot come unless Jesus goes. So Jesus' is just departure paves the way for the coming of the Holy Spirit. So it's not an end, but the beginning. The Holy Spirit can't come until the cross and the resurrection happen. They have to happen first because that is what is going to establish this new relationship between God and humanity. So the Holy Spirit can't come until that happens. And Jesus will send him to the disciples. And then what follows here in verses um, 8 through 11 is more information on the Holy Spirit's work and what he will do. So let's go ahead and read those three verses and we'll talk about them just a little bit. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he is going to, in many ways, continue the work of Jesus. Now, if you will flip with me over to John 3, and let's look at John 3, 16 uh, through 21. It says, you know, he's John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But everyone who lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And so we see here this, that the light exposes the deeds of the world, the sinful deeds of the world. And the world doesn't like that. So the world, when, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to continue that work of Jesus, of exposing, of convicting the world of its sin and telling the world the truth about what sin even is and telling the world the truth about what righteousness is and what judgment is, the true righteousness, true judgment, not according to the world's standards, but according to God's. Because the world judges sin and righteousness according to its own standards. And though, according to those standards, Jesus was crucified, right? He had been judged by 
the his contemporary religious authorities to be blasphemous and to not uh, to be sinful. He was condemned by the world, judged to be in the wrong by by the world. But according to God's standards, and his standards are perfect and true, Jesus is right before God. And we know that. And that is why, therefore, that Satan is condemned, right? This uh, Jesus finishing that work on the cross and re- coming back to life again on Easter Sunday condemns Satan forever. God has already won. The victory has happened. And Satan has lost. But as we know, the world persists in its unbelief. The world persists in seeing righteousness and sin and judgment in its own way and judging according to its own standards. But the Holy Spirit is coming to continue that work of Jesus, of exposing those deeds, those evil deeds of the world, as uh, John tells us in John 3. And Jesus is going to continue on talking about the Holy Spirit here in verses 12 through 15. And again, he calls him the, the spirit of truth. And Jesus starts off in verse 12 saying there's more that he wants to say to them, but they cannot bear it now. There's more than he possibly could communicate to them at this supper on the last night that he really has with them during his time on earth. Can you imagine the urgency Jesus felt and wanting to make sure he communicated and adequately prepared them for the road ahead, the road that he knows they are about to walk. The hour isn't in the distant future. The hour is in like that next hour or so, the next few minutes. That is, that is how immediate this, uh, this is for Jesus. And so he says, the spirit of truth is going to come in verse 13, and he will guide you into all truth. And, and then Jesus reminds them that he will only speak what he hears, not, um, he's not going to, he's going to speak what he hears from God, what he hears from Jesus. He will be sent and he will tell you what is yet to come. Speak only what he hears and he will tell you what it is yet to come. And he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. So the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's called the spirit of truth and he will guide them into all truth. We know that the disciples did not understand fully at any point up to this point. They have not understood everything that Jesus was saying. They have misunderstood Jesus and his role and what he came to do and and what uh, just who he was. They've misunderstood him a lot. And they will continue. We'll see that a little bit further on in this chapter. They finally say, oh, you're speaking clearly. We get it. And Jesus says, well, you still are not quite getting it completely. They don't get it really until afterwards, after Jesus's resurrection. And so when the Holy Spirit comes, he is going to guide them into all truth and guide them into uh, how to um, tell the good news, how to portray the good news, how to understand it interpretation and understanding the spirit of truth is going to guide them into their um, understanding and interpretation of Jesus it says and he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you so the holy spirit is going to glorify Jesus tell the truth about Jesus he's not all of a sudden going to say something different about him that they've never heard before or never experienced He's just going to illuminate the Jesus that they have spent time with and help them understand the significance of what he did during his time on earth. But it also says that he will speak um, what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. So there is going to be some more information. We know that John is going to receive a, a revelation. We have the book of Revelation, right? He is going to receive that. And we're then going to record that so that we can read it and have a bit of a picture, even though it is somewhat of a confusing picture of what is to come. So the Holy Spirit is going to continue Christ's work and when he comes, and he's also going to help the disciples as they portray the message, as they record the message, as they, and, and interpret the message and understand it 
but also convey the further things that Jesus wants to say to them because they can't bear them now. Can you imagine if John had received everything he saw in Revelation at this point? There's no way he was ready for that. But he was ready for it later on. And so we see Jesus preparing them for that. And starting in verse 16, Jesus goes on and he reminds them once again, you're not going to see me for a while. And then after a little while, you will see me. And this confuses his disciples. They just don't understand. What do you mean? And they're talking amongst themselves. I imagine them just kind of whispering to him, did you understand? Well, I don't know. What did you think? What do you think he means by that? And they you kind of get this sense that they're murmuring amongst themselves and trying to figure out what in the world did he mean? But Jesus, knowing all things as he does, knew they wanted to ask him about it. And so he instead asks, answers the question without them asking it. And then he answers it um, by using an analogy. So he said, they want to know, what do you mean by in a little while, you'll see me no more. And then you'll see me uh, after a little while, you'll see me again. And, and in verse 20, he says, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. So you think about Jesus is going to die, right? He's going to be crucified. And those who are in, who are wanting him to be killed, arrested and killed, are going to be very happy about this. But yet his disciples are not. They're going to be grief stricken. And then Jesus uses this this analogy of a woman in childbirth to help them understand. And he says, a woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because her joy that a child is born into the world. And so he says, that is what your grief will be like. You will be grieving, but then... I will see you again and you're going to rejoice and no one will be able to take away that joy. When we read scripture, often suffering comes before deliverance. Especially when we think about the Old Testament. We think about the people of Israel being enslaved in Egypt and you think about all the suffering that they went through, but then God delivered them. And then we, we see, so we see this kind of thread through the Old Testament. A good example of this Old Testament imagery of childbirth illustrating the anguish of Israel before God's deliverance is Isaiah 26. So if you want to flip there really quick, I'll point it out to you. Um, This is in the middle of a song of praise. And if you look down, starting in verse 17, it talks about a pregnant woman about to give birth who is writhing and crying out in pain. So if you want to read that for yourself, I encourage you to do that. It's a really good example of how this analogy has function in scripture. And it is in many other places. So if you are interested in some of those other references, I'd be happy to talk with you about those. But I wanted to read a quote from one of the commentaries I was reading this week. Um, It's Leslie Newbegin, and he was talking about how there's not birth without pain. And so the joy of the new age of the Messiah must be preceded by tribulation. The tribulations of Jesus and his disciples are, in fact, the birth pangs of the new creation. So this idea that There is going to be pain. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be trials as Jesus is going to go through. And then as his disciples will go through and followers of Jesus will continue to go through throughout the ages um, is is the birth pangs of the new creation. But the, the cool thing about it is that this joy of the new creation began at Jesus's resurrection. So for those who follow Jesus, we also get to share in that joy. So even though there is the trials and the tribulations that are going on, we also experience the joy of the victory being won already. And that's what makes our experience of salvation already and not yet. And then Jesus is going to go on if we're looking around uh, verse 25 and he says, I'm not, I've been speaking figuratively, but a time is coming when I'm no longer going to use this kind of language, but I'll tell you plainly. And then he says, in that day, you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the father on your behalf. No, the father himself self loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So this idea that God is now accessible. We have access to the father because of what Jesus has done for us on our behalf. He restored that right relationship. He says, and now we know that you're speaking clearly and that 
you know all things and you don't even need anyone to ask you questions. And so we believe that you came from God. Kind of essentially they're saying, well, we get it. We figured it out. And Jesus responds, do you now believe? A time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone for my father is with me. So he's saying, okay, you think you've gotten it, but the time is coming when you're going to be scattered, when you're not going to be with me because you're going to be too scared. you are be too overwhelmed by what is happening. So the disciples think that they understand clearly, but Jesus is saying, but you really don't quite get it because you're going to be scattered. You're going to be scared. And the time is just about to happen because we're only about a chapter away from that happening in John's gospel. Next week, we're going to talk about Jesus's prayer. And then the next thing that's going to happen is the arrest. It's only John 18 where we're going to get to that. So there's not going to be that long of a time between Jesus saying these things to them and them be completely freaking out and running away um, and not knowing what to do and being completely filled with grief. But yet Jesus has told them all these things so that they won't fall away, so that they will remain faithful. But he closes this part of his discourse with this in verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This peace isn't just ceasing from having conflict or war or strife, but it's this idea of completion and wholeness or that God is with us in the midst, in the midst of whatever our circumstances are. This isn't a promise of not having any bad things happen. This is a promise is that God is with us in the midst of our trials and our tribulations and our struggles and those difficult days and those good days and those mediocre days. And he's with us and we can take heart because we know who has the victory, who has overcome the world. God has. He's overcome the world. Jesus' work on the cross and his death and resurrection restores that right relationship. He has overcome the world. The ruler of this world is already condemned. He's already lost. And that is some good news. News that is worth celebrating. And even though the disciples didn't quite get it, I was really struck as I was reading this, just this, especially the second half of chapter 16, bringing out this point about Jesus not needing us to go to him, to go to the father. It's like that we have access to the father that we can come straight to him with confidence. We can approach his throne as it says in Hebrews four. And that this same God who is on his throne is the one that is with us in the midst in this world. You may have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So no matter what is happening in our lives, we can trust, we can have faith, we can know that Jesus is with us in the midst, in the midst of our struggles, because he has overcome. That victory is sure. What an amazing promise. So next week, we will dive into chapter 17. And I love it. It is Jesus's prayer. And I love just reading it and thinking about it. So I encourage you to go ahead and read it ahead of time. Um, and think through all the different parts of it. What is he praying about? Who is he praying for? Think through those things before we gather next week, before you gather with your classes next week, and really consider what is it that Jesus is praying for in these final moments before he's arrested. I'll see you next week. Bye!